So I want to uh, welcome everybody. I'm Liz, who's working from the loft at Liz's, and Liz's antique hardware downstairs. The gentleman filming right here is Randy Kreeft. Uh, he is uh, a, a big part of this gallery, and he's now a, a videographer as well. Um, we are very, very honored to have this show up and have Betty Ann Brown, our curator, who has selected these amazing artists that are, that are behind me. Um, I really want to welcome you all, and I really, uh, I'm really thrilled to have Jim Panassi here. Woo! artists have to say. Uh, just before we're ending, I'll, I'll have a couple of other announcements, so um, you'll turn the floor over to me right around the end. I will indeed. <laughs> At this point, I will turn the floor over to our curator, Betty and Brown. Yay. It really is exciting for me to be here with all of you and with these incredible artists. So I thought we would start out by my asking them a couple of questions and letting them respond. I've already warned them that they have a two minute limit. <laughs> and if we have anybody in a space hog, I will pull out my iPhone and time that. <laughs> so um, the, gong, the gong will go off when my iPhone hits two minutes if we, if we need to do that. I don't think we're going to. But, um, I thought I'd ask them a couple of questions just to, you know, get everything warmed up and get everything going. And then, of course, what's really going to make this cool is to have questions from you and dialogue and comments from you. So pack those in your awareness and be ready to jump in and join us um, after, as I said, we get everybody started. Uh, so in case you didn't hear Liz. My name is Betty Brown, and I'm an art historian, and I write about contemporary art, and I occasionally curate exhibitions, and this is one of those occasional exhibitions, and it's been really a thrill to work with these artists. I count all of them as personal friends now, and I, I really am blessed to have them as friends. They're such cool people. Um, before we um, go into the panel any further, I just want to point out that we do have another of the exhibition artists right there, Andre Yi, who is the artist who is in the top part of the stairwell. And you need to look at those drawings closely because from a distance you might think, okay, they're drawings of dead birds, um, which they are. But if you get a little closer, you'll see that they're really incredible mixed media productions. And there are like pencil shavings and splatters of white out and many other things that you don't imagine as usually being part of drawings and they're really engaging with it together. So. And is he the only other artist here? Yes. I mean they're almost all of you are artists. <laughs> but I'm an exhibition artist, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna just go down the row and I'm gonna um, ask each artist to talk to us for more than two minutes about their backgrounds, because I think it's always really interesting to find out how somebody had discovered that they were an artist and what kind of training they had or not had, and um, you know how they got to be here. So the first person I'm asking is Jody Benassi. Jody Benassi, that's her. That's me. That's she. And her work is right behind you all. The three pieces, they are pencil drawings with some ink, one larger and two smaller, and if you haven't put your face in those drawings, you need to go do that after the panel, because they're astonishingly varied and surreal and fascinating and funny and disturbing, and <laughs> they deal with gun violence, so they are topical as well as wonderfully executed. So, Jody. <laughs> Tell us about your background and how you ended up on these walls. Um, well, you know, I think I always drew. It wasn't a decision to draw. It wasn't a choice. And um, after my son was born, I suddenly decided to come out. And that's 23 years ago. And uh, for me, my, my background, I'm self-taught. So, uh, I always draw, and I draw eight to ten hours a day. 
So, um, and, and I get up at four in the morning so I can actually do the life things that we all have to do and pay bills and, and I do commissions. So that's basically my background. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Um, next to Jody is Susan Feldman, also known sometimes as Susan Feldman Tucker. And um, she is exhibited in two rooms. Most importantly, for you all who've been drinking that wine, that room, which is bathroom, is, we are so lucky, it is surrounded with Susan Feldman Tucker's, but Susan Feldman's. But if you didn't come up this staircase, you missed the fact that she did an installation through the whole staircase, from the ground all the way up to the other drawings that I just mentioned to you. And it is a string installation with drawings of string and wood punctuating it. So Susan, <laughs> tell us about you and how you got to be doing those amazing string installations. Uh, well, I, I too am a drawer. I started out as a drawer. Uh, from the time I was young as well. And um, I remember distinctly deciding in high school, like in 11th or 12th grade, that I would spend the year in my art class only using pencil. And so, uh, and it was a studio art, AP studio art class. So it was the first of its kind. Like that was the only AP class my high school had was drawing. And it was like a two hour class. So for a year solid, every single day for two hours, I drew. And um, and I just you know that was my my main um, method of um, expressing myself through my art. But I really I started when I was eight with oil painting. Uh, I studied with a, a family of artists, the Drybound family. That I don't know if any of you know them. Um, but they were in Studio City where I grew up, and so I studied with the daughter who was 16 and I was eight, and then I moved up to the father when I was. Uh, when she went to college. Um, and, uh, and then I went to Cal State Northridge for some time, not too much time. The rest of the time, I, I'm also self-taught. Uh, didn't go to art school, just wanted to really do it. So I've been doing it for uh, however long that is, you know, since I was five or six years. A couple of years. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, of course, did work as a graphic designer and an art director, and, and I was always able to, you know, make a living doing something in the creative field. But then when we had our first uh, daughter, who's now 22, I went back into the studio to just be a, a, a you know, a studio artist. And um, I do a lot of mixed media work. I build a lot of things, structures, I call them, with found wood and string. and. Uh, I do, I work in various materials, so the drawing aspect comes in when I need to bring myself down, when I need to get grounded more from making things that are building, and so I can sit quietly and draw. And what to draw? My work, or aspects of my work, or representations of my work. So that's what the wood is all about. And the string is a, a way to draw with string. And, and the drawings to it, like Betty said. So. Thank you, Susan. I yield to my friend on the left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your friend on the left is J. Michael Walker, and he did the three uh, breathtaking drawings on um, my left, your right, and I wanted to talk about him, but not now. Because first, J. Michael, can you tell us about your background? Um, well, there seems to be a meme going through here, which is that we're all self-taught and we started drawing when we were very, very young. That's the first thing I remember almost about my childhood. Um, and I just presumed as a child, since I knew I was an artist, that when it came time to get out of high school, I would go to art school. Um, but my, I came from a broken home and my father bled every time he wrote a check to my mother. And so I was not going to art school. And so I kind of worked my way through college and stayed home and worked in sketchbooks and grew. Um, but another aspect that's, I think, very key to my development as an artist is, is my cultural background, which is I was born and raised in uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I was born during segregation. And I was born into a culture that was on the wrong side of history. And that created questions in me 
that roiled inside me all throughout my adolescence, even though adults who disagreed with that. And so all of these things kind of came together, and I got to a point when I was working my way through college when uh, mana fell from heaven, and I got invited to go to a village in Mexico and do some volunteer work. And Mexico saved my life. I bought a box of colored pencils, took them there, fell in love with the culture, the landscape, the language, and a young, beautiful young lady who I married three years later, and she's still with me. We just had our 38th wedding. Oh. And so, so really, I mean, the, the uh, development, uh, self-development of my, of my abilities as a visual artist, and my cultural leanings, uh, you know, they're intertwined and inseparable in terms of how I've developed as an artist. Thank you. As I said, I am going to ask them to talk about their works in specific. I know you guys want to hear about J. Michaels, but you can see it, and it's mysteriously evocative. So we'll hear about that in a minute. Next to J. Michael is Milo Reese, who did the works immediately behind me. And um, Milo is an East Coast person who was uh, crazy famous in New York and left it all and moved here with a really beautiful woman who happens to be a dear friend of mine. And um, Ila, tell us about your background, because you actually have elaborate training. Well, I, I was first going to say just, uh, I think we're all self-taught in some, at different points in our lives. I have so much education, it's silly. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I have spent my life always wanting to improve myself and build upon all that education without having someone ram it down my throat. Um, nonetheless, I, I'm a Manhattan boy, New York City bred. Um, my mom, from a single mom, uh, ironically, my father. Spent his last 10 years in Arkansas. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's bizarre. I just you found this out. I just found somewhere. this out. I'm finding that I'm more and more I hear Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but when, uh, my mom was a uh, powerful New York City uh, journalist. And one day when I was about four years old, I started bothering her when she was on the phone. She said, Why don't I'm on the phone? Draw something. And I had never drawn anything. I had never shown any inclination. And then when I went to the window and I drew with a magic marker the Triborough Bridge outside the window. The next day, I was sent, she sent me to the Museum of Modern Art School for Children. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, every Saturday from there on, we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where, which was three blocks from my house. And I literally, that's where. I became the artist that I am. Coupled with my mom, my mom was a writer, so my work has always dealt with literary subject matter. I, I'm, I'm the type of artist that, I just because I'm an artist, I don't think I'm that brilliant. I'm a good artist. That's it. So I've always fallen back on world literature, religion, culture, myth, to paint. And I add my own two cents. I can go into that later. Yeah, because we want to get more about it. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I don't want to... But he has degrees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> degrees of degrees. I have degrees. <laughs> you have letters on Yes, degree. I have the master's degree because mom wanted to pay for it. And I said, great, two more years to pay without worrying about a living. But all joking aside, I, well, I did three years of my schooling in Rome, Italy, and three years in Philadelphia. And um, more importantly than that, growing up in New York City, and this might explain some of the work, tell me if I'm speaking too long, uh, is that I have this love of abstraction and love of Renaissance draftsmanship and ability that are on par with each other. When I was six years old, I saw my first Clifford Still, uh, my first de Kooning, my first Pollock. It was like looking at those those early middle, you know, the Quattrocento paintings that I fell in love with when I first, first, very first time went to the Met with my mom. 
and they've grown. My whole life has been, how do I reconcile loving complete figuration and loving complete non-objective abstraction? And my aesthetics have always been a battle. And well, when I first met later. Milo at a dinner party, um, I said, "He's, you know." I said, so what kind of work do you do? And he said, well, in fairness to my mom, he had just moved in, into a new house. Yeah. And so he was a little bit tired. But I said, so well, you know, basics is abstract or is it figurative? And he couldn't answer or refused to. <laughs> Thank you, Milo. So Nancy Baker Cahill did the breathtaking works over there, the drawing of the grief-like abstract forms, and the ripped drawing sculpture that is suspended and spinning, sort of kind of. So Nancy Baker Cahill, tell us about your background. Okay, so um, I also started drawing very early on. I am a mass hole, grew up in Boston. And I learned, um, my father actually insisted that I take drawing classes at the Museum of Fine Arts. So that was actually my first like formal education. And actually it was a really, really fantastic foundation. And I and I remember we, we first started drawing in the Buddha rooms. And so early on developed a real sensitivity to light and dark and tone and that sort of thing. So really technical. Um, and drew all through high school, um, very much wanted to go to art school, didn't. Um, I got in, but I wasn't, I was not, I did not, my parents were not actually that excited about it. But I did get a great education um, at Williams College, where I, which has a really, really rigorous art program. Um, but then I got, um, I was really like juiced up about a lot of political stuff, and I really thought I was going to um, single-handedly revolutionize the world, um, which is how I guess was, um, collegiate graduates feel, but um, <laughs> so anyway, um, and I ended up in public television, which is where I met my husband, because um, I was also a writer. So uh, we uh, packed up a truck for a variety of personal reasons, packed up a truck, moved out here about 20 years ago, and when I got here, I had this intention and this vision that I would um, finally be allowed to kind of pursue my art full time. and. What ended up happening was, it's Los Angeles for a provincial Bostonian. It's it's really it's antipodal. It's it's completely the opposite. So I really lost my footing. I I, I lost my way completely. And so I had a, a series of creative fits and starts, and um, but never, uh, you know, just never kind of found my voice again, which I really confidently had coming out of college. And um, it's interesting to me how many people how their children, having children catalyze their practice. Um, because for me, I had two children and um, first, and, um, and I love them dearly, and I, and I wouldn't want it any other way. Um, but because of some other issues, my daughter had some serious health issues, um, and, and also just not being ready, I didn't pursue my work for a good 12 years. And finally, when my third child was born, it really, it was a serious catalyst. It was almost like a, like a bomb. I, I realized, like, I, the time is now. And I don't know, you know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. So um, I started drawing and just basically haven't stopped. So, um, but I really, like, got back into this kind of drawing about in 2013, I would say. I mean, I, I really experimented with a lot of different media prior to that, but I kind of, um, Feel like this is a kind of coming home. It's a kind of return to my most sort of to my own vernacular and my own, you know, my most comfortable medium. Thank but, you. Uh, Thank you.